So we just talked about uh, ecosystem structure, right? And we looked at how there's both, is it working? Good. We looked at how there's both uh, the structure of trophic levels, so the structure, the ways that organisms are arranged in an ecosystem, as well as, and then now we're gonna talk about the actual physical structure of an ecosystem. So the way in which the physical components of an ecosystem are organized in space. And both of those, I'm going to show you, both of those can tell us a lot about how an ecosystem functions. And they, that, in turn, can tell us a lot about ecosystem services. So this is one of the examples that we're going to show you later today, hopefully. And that's using LiDAR data. So this is lasers that are gone from, from planes. To, to show us the three-dimensional structure of an ecosystem. In this case, it's a mangrove forest. Okay, and we're gonna take a look at this particular site, and we're gonna try to look at the different metrics of the forest and see what we can tell about the forest from that type of data. And when we know things like that, we can tell a lot about how that ecosystem functions. So we know certain forests, they have a certain canopy height, they're good for certain birds, or they're good for certain monkeys. But if they don't have that canopy height, then they can't use that habitat in the same way. So this tells us a lot about how maybe a forest ecosystem will function. Another example is, in this case, a coral reef. So now they're using LiDAR also to assess coral reefs. And of course, coral reefs have a very complex structure. And they know that that structure is directly related to maybe the diversity of the organisms that can be found uh, or the types of organisms that can be found. So in this case, they found that the number of, of organisms was directly related to the distance that you could see along the reef. And what that means is that if a predator is on that reef, he can only see so far or she can only see so far. And that means that there's more hiding places for all the other organisms. And so that translates to more diversity. That's what this paper is, is trying to present. This idea that the structural complexity of the reef controls how predator and prey interact, and that controls the diversity of the reef. So in this case, the structural of the reef is very important for determining the diversity of the reef. So this is, the, this is another reason why it might be really important for us to try to measure these structural metrics, ecosystem structure. In this case, we have a grassland. They also use LiDAR to measure this grassland. And just by the structural metrics of the LiDAR, the lasers, they could tell which species are present and they could tell these seasonal differences just by the structure. So again, just knowing some of these structural characteristics of an ecosystem, we can try to help explain the function of that ecosystem. What species are there? What season might they be in? Are they beginning to flower? Are they just beginning to sprout from the spring? All of those can tell us a little bit about how that ecosystem is functioning. And so this is why ecosystem structure, again, in this sense, is one of these biodiversity variables that might really help us assess and manage our ecosystem. So the general rules of ecosystem structure, and these again are general, these aren't laws, so they don't apply maybe to every ecosystem, but generally the more structural complexity that you have in an ecosystem, the more diversity you're gonna have. Why do we think that is? Going back to our theory of ecology, why would structural complexity mean more biodiversity? I think this is now what we can call um, habitat heterogeneity. Okay. And the more the habitats, the more the species gets in a niche, I can say. Good, that's the key word that I was looking for. Okay. Niche, right? right? Yeah. So we said this is related to habitat heterogeneity. So the more habitats there are, the more niches they are. Okay, and one of the, the rules of ecology is organisms are always gonna try to fill a niche if it's available. So if there's a resource available 
something is going to try to exploit that resource. Okay, that's just how life works. Okay, animals are always competing for resources. So if something becomes available, an organism will try to use it. And space is a resource. Right? Some organisms only use the forest floor. Other organisms only use the canopy. That's their space. That's their resources. If they're only in the canopy, that means they don't have to compete with the organisms on the forest floor. So it makes their life easier. So if there's more complexity, that means there's more niches. And that means it's gonna be, there's gonna be an organism or a species that's gonna try to use that niche. Okay, so this is why generally, as you increase structural complexity, you increase biodiversity. And this is why when we look at forests, or when we look at coral reefs, we're looking for the structural complexity, because it usually means there's probably going to be more species there. Also generally, the, gr the greater the extent, or the greater the area of the habitat or the ecosystem, the higher the biodiversity, as well as the higher the resilience. Okay, so this is the species area curve, right? As you increase the area of a forest, you're going to find more species, right? That makes sense. If you have a one hectare forest compared to a 10 hectare forest, which one do you think will have more species? The 10 hectares, okay? So that, that's simple, but that's part of these metrics, okay? This is a structural metric. If it's more complex and it has a greater area, you're probably going to have more species there. Right? It's just a probability, yeah. I mean, it's not a, it's not a law. It's not a law, it's not always the case, no. These are just general rules. These are things that we found for a lot of different ecosystems, but you can't say that it's always the case, no. Okay. As you have more trophic complexity, you also have more resilience. What is resilience? What do you guys think I mean by resilience? Yes. The ability to recover after shock. Good. So the, the answer was the ability to recover after shock. That's a pretty good general definition. Something happens, a fire happens. How quickly can that ecosystem come back to where it was before the fire? And can it come back to the same state that it was before the fire? Or does it totally change the way that it was, the way that it is? That's resilience. Okay, so if you have more organisms and more, more trophic complexity, you're going to be more resilient because that means you're going to be able to fulfill all of the niches that were there before. If you only have one organism per trophic level and you have a disturbance and you lose that organism, that trophic level is now gone. And so you're probably not going to have the same ecosystem that you had before. But if, in a complex trophic structure, you had multiple organisms at the same trophic level, and you had a disturbance, and you lose one of those organisms or one of those species, you still have the other species there that can occupy that trophic level. So you have a resilient ecosystem that can still function a little bit more like it did before the disturbance. So this is another really important reason why we're interested in having this trophic complexity. We talk a lot about conservation. We talked earlier about why one species is important. And we tend to focus on one species or these big species just because we like them. Sometimes they're not the most important species. Sometimes you have certain species that offer this trophic complexity that we need for a stable, resilient ecosystem. So that's another thing that we need to look for. Generally, if we have an absence of predators, we have a less resilient ecosystem. We see this a lot when we, we talked the other day about how we lost the American wolf in the eastern half of the United States, the North American wolf. We killed it all. And so what happened is we saw deer come back to that area and they're overpopulated and now hunters have to shoot them. And sometimes the hunters can't shoot enough so the government has to come in and shoot all of them as much as it can just to try to control the population. 
This actually happened in the American West recently. A very good example is they reintroduced the American wolf in the American West. And what they saw was, of course, the wolves ate some more elks. But they saw things that they never expected. They saw rivers changing course. Just because they introduced the wolf. Why would a river change course because you introduce a predator? I didn't know. I don't expect you guys to know, so I'll tell you. It's because when there were no wolves, the elk had no fear. The elk are the like, big deer that they eat. They had no fear, so they would go down to the river and they would eat the nice young trees that were down on the river. And so this lost, the river lost a lot of its structure, a lot of the soil uh, structure that it had there because none of the trees could grow and, and kind of maintain the, the riverbank. When they introduced the wolf, the elk began getting really scared. They wouldn't go out to the river to graze anymore because they were out in the open and it was easy for the wolves to find them. So they stayed back in the forest and they ate in the forest. This meant trees could grow along the river and this meant the river had to find a new course around the trees. Okay, so this is an amazing example and it's well documented and they've shown a lot of different ways in which this has happened but this is a way in which when you lose these top predators you lose kind of this a lot of times you can lose the structure of an ecosystem in a lot of ways also related to this is this idea of evenness species evenness this is when you have too many of one species so evenness would mean you have the same number of all species same number of deer, same number of wolves, same number of plants. That would be a perfectly even system. That doesn't exist, of course. But we can have more evenness and less evenness. And when we have less evenness, that means one species is dominating that ecosystem. And that's less resilient because it means if we lost that species, we lose a big part of that ecosystem and how it functions. Whereas if it was more even, if you lost that species, the other species are there to kind of fill in the gap. Okay, so these are ways in which ecosystem structure directly translates into these ideas of diversity and ecosystem function. Right, so this is why we're kind of trying to get you guys used to these, uh, these variables. So the, the, the function, we looked earlier at the structure, how these different components are arranged within the ecosystem. The function is the collective processes of the ecosystem that together give a specific result. And we could be talking about a lot of things when we mean result, but it's what happens when, a f when the ecosystem is doing what it's doing. So we're looking at all of these arrows. These are all functions, okay? This conversion of sunlight to biomass, that's photosynthesis. That's a process that it serves a function in that ecosystem. So you have this arrangement of the parts of the ecosystem, and then you have these processes and functions that connect everything. And at the end, you have these ecosystem services that result from all of these functions kind of put together. So you have the process, translates to a function, which translates to an ecosystem service. So let's look at some examples. Generally, and this is according to uh, Rudolf de Groot, who's one of the authorities on ecosystem services and kind of has led uh, the, the field over the years. He's defined these, these into four main, main categories. The biggest is regulation. So this is the regulation of essential ecological processes through the different interactions, through the bio geochemical cycles and the other processes that happen. So we'll give examples, but this is the biggest, the biggest group of functions that we're talking about. So they listed this long list. So you have gas regulation, climate regulation, disturbance prevention, water regulation, soil retention, soil formation, nutrient regulation, these are all functions, pollination. It's a function of the ecosystem. And it results from these processes. 
Okay, so pollination results from the role that organisms, that biota play in the movement of floral gametes or floral pollen. That's a process that results in this function of pollination. Climate regulation, the influence of land cover and biologically mediated processes on the climate. Okay, so you have all of these processes occurring in different land uses and that's producing different functions for climate regulation. And all of these then translate into different ecosystem services. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too much about the ecosystem services because I think we're going to cover that tomorrow, correct? Or no? Did we already cover that? We already covered that. Ecosystem services? Yes, okay. So we, we've already covered that, sorry. But either way, you can still kind of see the connection here, okay? Next you have habitat. This is an important one. So it's the refuge and reproductive habitat that's provided by an ecosystem. That's a function. It's providing habitat. It's giving this result of provisioning of habitat to different organisms. So, so sort of the, uh -huh. can I check the, yeah, this one. Okay, if someone says pollination, uh -huh. and says one of the ecosystem services as listed in the column number three, yes, is he or she wrong? But because that's listed as function. No, so it can be all. It can be both. It can be both. It can be all. Some of some processes combine with other processes to form an ecosystem service, but some processes are ecosystem services in themselves, and so pollination is one of those. You have this process of ecosystem service, this function of ecosystem service, that is directly serving us. Okay, so if it directly serves us, then it's also an ecosystem service. Then production is basically photosynthesis. The conversion of materials into food and other resources. This is production and this produces of course a lot of different ecosystem services. Food, raw materials, we use a lot of wood. Okay, A lot of different ecosystem services are provided by this function of production and photosynthesis. This one is the last one and it's a little bit more, it's much more, it is entirely human centric and this idea that there's this function of ecosystem of providing spiritual reflection, cognitive development and these cultural resources that we, that we get from ecosystems. So this doesn't serve the biota so much as it serves us. So that's why it's, it's kind of more strictly an ecosystem service, okay, because it's, it's human, it's centered on humans and not so much on the function and the ecology of the ecosystem. But according to these authors, it's still here, okay. So there is a little bit of a, of a mix in with the function and the services and the processes, okay. So you get all of them together, and I think we have a few examples. So. Ecosystem processes, photosynthesis, the big ones are herbivory, predation, decomposition, those are processes that occur in an ecosystem. Okay, evapotranspiration, pollination, those are all processes that are occurring. And all together they have these different functions. So the function of evapotranspiration, part of the function is to cycle water through that ecosystem. Okay, part of the function of pollination is to spread gametes throughout the ecosystem and to allow for reproduction. So, process of photosynthesis, you have all these functions that are related to that. Evapotranspiration comes from photosynthesis. Chemical processing comes from photosynthesis. We're changing carbon into carbon molecules. We're changing it into sugars. We're converting these chemicals in different ways. We have the production of biomass. Okay, that's a function that results from this process of ecosystem services. And those translate into these different services. Obviously, when we grow vegetables or when we grow uh, plants, that translates into food. That's an ecosystem service. It also translates into carbon sequestration and climate regulation. It also provides soil erosion prevention, what we were just talking about with the trees on the riverbank. 
Okay? Those trees helped prevent the erosion of soil. Another example, herbivory. Herbivory, so organisms that are eating plants, through that process, they're serving this function of controlling primary producers. The other day we went to uh, a national forest and there was these big gaps in the forest. And Aida couldn't, she was, her mind was blown. She couldn't figure out why the forest canopy was not closed. It's a forest, there should be trees, but it was bare ground. And there was this herbaceous vegetation on the ground. And it was maybe blocking the trees from growing. And so one of the hypotheses is that when elephants were eliminated from that forest, they were no longer eating the herbs on the ground and the trees could grow. But when we removed elephants, those herbs on the ground blocked all of the light from the trees, so the trees can't grow anymore. So in this case, when we lost herbivory, we lost this function and the control of primary producers. Okay, so this is how these processes translate into these different functions. And again, this is how when we look at these diagrams of an ecosystem, we could see that if we took out the herbivory from that diagram, we could look at the connections and we could maybe predict what would happen. Predation does the same thing, except it controls the herbivores. So sometimes we have the opposite problem, where we don't have we don't have enough vegetation because there's too many herbivores. They're eating all the vegetation because we lost the predators. So that's what I was talking about with the wolves. Okay, we lost the predators, so the herbivores kind of went out of control, and then that changed this control of con the control of primary production. Sources and potential for ecosystem function. There's not a whole lot, I and mean, this is something that's relatively new. Uh, ecosystem services. That's kind of where most of the the attention has been focused. And so you've seen the connection between ecosystem function and ecosystem service. And there's a lot of applications that help you evaluate ecosystem service. And so you can use those to kind of also infer and help you understand the functions of an ecosystem. So this website is from the US Environmental Protection Agency. And they actually have a nice database of ecological models. So these are models that run, you set up what the model structure, what the ecosystem structure looks like. You say there's this many herbivores, there's this many producers, there's this many car there predators, there's this much to begin with, the predators eat this much, the herbivores eat this much, and you say, okay, go. Show me what happens in 10 years. And it produces these results. And each model is different, and it produces, it, it simulates a different ecosystem and a different ecosystem services, but it, it, you might find something that kind of helps you understand your ecosystem. So there might be a grassland model that helps you understand your savanna ecosystem or your forest. There might be a forest model that helps you understand your forest. Okay, so there's a, a long list of different ecosystem models that you can explore. Some of them are updated and some of them are not. Um, so you just kind of have to maybe explore this site a little bit if this is something you're interested in. But this is a big field of ecology, ecosystem modeling. People that spend a lot of their time and a lot of their life doing these models. We have already know this one, so we've seen INVEST Okay, this is another one. It's just another way to model ecosystem services. We, we give it a certain number of inputs, okay, and we kind of evaluate the ecosystem services that we get out. And again, ecosystem services are kind of a direct result of the functioning of that ecosystem. So we can kind of also use it to evaluate the, the functioning of that ecosystem. So you guys will have a copy of this. Uh, and you'll be able to see these websites on your own. This is one that I used uh, as a master's student. Unfortunately, it's not free. Uh, you do have to pay for it, but they do have a 30-day trial. Uh, and what I like about it is that, you remember those the diagrams that we were looking at earlier? This is a really cool way of kind of building an ecosystem model. 
So maybe you have your producers here, you have your consumers here, and they're connected by this. The producers eat this much, you have this much water coming in. And if you're able to give a good number to all this stuff, you can run simulations. And you can say, okay, how does this ecosystem function if, if we had less water? So I'm predicting in my ecosystem, climate change is gonna result in 50% less water in 20 years. I wanna know how my ecosystem is gonna function with 50% less water. So I can build my ecosystem and I can say, okay, you have 50% less water, what happens? How does this ecosystem function without that much water? What changes? And that really allows us to plan for the future. It allows us to set up a management scenario that might help reduce some of the, the bad impacts that would happen from the climate change. So um, again, unfortunately, they don't make this free, but you can try it for 30 days, and I think they have some examples online that you could use. I'm not sure how expensive it is to buy, but uh, I was able to use it for my master's program, and I really liked it. So I just thought I'd uh, present that as well. Do you have a tip on that? Um, What's that? Your dissertation? You said you use it in your master's? I use it in my master's, yeah. Your thesis or? For my thesis, yeah. Yeah. Thesis. yeah. I think I might, I'm not sure, let me, I'll see if I still have it. I definitely don't have it on this computer, but I might have it somewhere else. So, what, why do we do this? What's the point? The main one is that we're really, when we're building these models, we're evaluating the function of an ecosystem. We want to understand how an ecosystem works. And this helps us optimize ecosystem output to human communities. So if we can understand how an ecosystem functions, then we can help optimize the ecosystem services that are given by that ecosystem. And in a lot of cases, that's what we want to do. Okay, we need to get more food out of this ecosystem. If we understand how the ecosystem functions, then we can try to change the ways in which it might produce more food. We can manage for more sustainable social ecological systems so we can help modify ecosystems so that when humans are using it, they're not over exploiting it and they're not taking too many resources. And the ecosystem is gonna be able to continue functioning normally even though we're taking its resources. Predicting disturbance response. This is a big one, especially with climate change. Climate change is a disturbance and we're not really sure how these ecosystems are gonna to respond to climate change. But if we can build a model and we can understand how an ecosystem functions, then we can predict how it's going to respond to these different disturbances. And so that's another big reason why we do this. And of course, just for science. Okay, that doesn't have to be, you don't have to be helping anybody. We prefer that you do. But you can also just do it just to understand the system. That's what a lot of people do. They just want to understand how ecology works. In order to do that, you need to know the function of all the different components of the ecosystem. You need to know what role they serve and which organisms play a part in that functioning. 